to begin the Roseville Building Bond Review. Okay. Thank you, Rita. And uh, real quickly, because we do want to get to our panel, but um, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota does have a general position in favor of bond referenda being uh, passed by local voters using property taxes to fund buildings. And um, so that has been studied, and our league helped study that quite a while ago. And um, so we, so generally the league supports bonds. We encourage always our members to learn specifically about the bonds in our communities. And so um, there's quite a few leaguers, I'm sure it's no surprise to the people here that there's quite a few leaguers who are leading the 623 Roseville Area Schools bond effort. And uh, Huda Youssef and I are two of the four co-chairs of that effort and Huda was going to be here up until she got called into work so she's not able to be here but we do have um, two of our members on the school board who voted for it and they passed it unanimously Kitty Goggins and Todd Anderson and then we also had many members of our league who were on the study committees over the summer and fall. Kathy Juniman was one of them, and maybe there's others. I'm missing anybody. Raise your hand. Um, and then we, and, and actually Huda and Curtis were too, but I'm going to introduce Curtis now in a different role. Um, and if you would stand up, um, Curtis Johnson is a brand new member of the League of Women Voters. He's also. Um, chairing one of the um, levy or bond referendum committees. I forgot which one, so he can tell you in just a second. And um, he's also running for the 623 school board. And um, unless there's a huge write-in candidate, um, uh, he's already won because there are three <laughs> candidates for three seats. So <laughs> So Cecilia Warner, being the wise woman that she is, said, I don't think we need a candidates meeting for that. If they already <laughs> won, we'll focus on Falcon Heights where they have a real race. Um, and then also, um, Mary Zakaris is a member of our league. She's been a member for a long time. And so Mary can stand up. And she is, she recently retired, but she of course went, just like all leaguers, she went right back to work the next day and works part time for the school district still. But on her volunteer time, she is volunteering to be the administrator for our levy referendum. And that was, that is like, a major load off the rest of our shoulders. So um, she's going to be passing around information, including um, we have a flyer that um, one of the volunteers on the two of the volunteers on. I don't have flyers yet. Okay, but this is the visual that volunteers on the committee. One of them is Don Mathers, who's a member of our league too, and does our membership directory. Um, and then Mary's going to be passing around, as Curtis speaks, um, some information. What have you got there? I have, um, and there's not enough for everybody, but I have a list of what the early voting is. And then I have um, a fact sheet from the school district, because the school district can only give the facts. And then um, I think somebody has absentee ballot applications, if people want them. Yes. Yeah. So they're here. and. Um, then I will send this information in PDF so it can be sent out to the members. And it's also available on the district webpage. If you go to the district webpage, there's a great big web button that says build a bond. And you can find all the factual information about the study that the community was in that did. And so that's lots of information. And there's tons of information on the website if you click on the building bond. There's also four community meetings, and unfortunately, uh, the first one is tonight, um, yeah. and, but there's three <laughs> more, and uh, so I hope I encourage you to look on that sheet and it tells what the dates are, and you could go go to other ones. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Curtis. If you want to come up here and briefly say why you're working on the bond? Okay. Um, hi there. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Curtis Johnson, and. I've got two really good reasons that um, I'm working for the bond. Um, their names are Jamie and Emily, and they're my kids now. Um, my oldest, Emmy, is in high school, and she will actually see probably none of this because she will be off to college and conquering the world. Um, but my uh, little one, 
uh, Jamie is uh, in middle school, so she'll actually get to see some of this, so she's very excited. Um, really, my, my kids have been part of the Roseville School District, Roseville Area School District, um, since they were in kindergarten, and I have been very involved in their education. Um, some would say, they would say too involved. Um, but Roseville has great teachers. Okay, and they've got great principals, and they've got wonderful folks that do everything to make sure that uh, these kids graduate, and that when they do, that they're just class kids. And when I found out that we haven't had a major referendum, okay, in 25 years, that kind of blew my mind, okay. Um, we're always being told to do more with less. You know, guess what? We, we've done that, okay? And we've been quite successful at that. So, but uh, now it's the time to reinvest, okay, in the buildings. With, if, with the passage of this uh, bond referendum, all of the buildings will get substantial upgrades, much needed upgrades, um, not, including, but not limited to, um, Updates to the the, uh, the air conditioning systems. And if you've ever been in school at during the summer, you know why that's necessary. So, um, okay. Um, so let's see. Um, for basically, folks have been working on this referendum. And I've been working on this referendum for just a little over a year. The process started two years ago. Okay, so this wasn't just thrown together. <laughs> um, if you go to isd623.org, there literally is a big red button um, that, that you can click um, that will actually show you the history, um, you know, everything that's gone into uh, the preparation of this referendum, how it affects you personally. Um, and uh, I hope that when you do so, that you'll see that this is something that is not just good for the kids, it's good for all of us. So. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. And then Mary is also, I'm gonna pass this around. If anybody wants to help with the bond, you can sign up and get the sheet back to Mary. And for those of you who are have just come in, we have uh, some people who weren't able to come for the dinner, but they wanted to come. The chairs in that room are all ours to bring in. So as people, if other people come in, if those of you in the back could encourage people just to get a chair, bring it in like those of you who just arrived in. And welcome. Okay, well now we are ready for our major attraction of the evening, which is the panel up here, the two people to my right. And as, um, as most of you know, because actually this great turnout tonight is all members of the league and guests, because for some reason um, this meeting did not get in the newspaper like usual. So usually we have you know 10 or 20 people from the public. This is we are just the members of the league and prospective members who are interested in the topic of affordable housing. And we've been studying it, as you know, for the past year, and we've been doing advocacy in the city councils, and now in our continuing quest to learn more about it, we have two people who are experts in the area of affordable housing and working with people in the trenches. You know, we have had some people that work on policy, but tonight we get to hear people who actually go face to face with people who need housing. And the first one to my right is familiar probably to some of you, Representative Peter Fisher. I met him when he was like 15. <laughs> and his mother had him working for the League of Women Voters. And <laughs> so we've known he was a good egg for a very long time. And um, when he starts out, before you start speaking, I'd like you to give us an update on your wonderful mother because he's told some of us informally 
and we know she's had health issues. But Lorraine Fisher is a 50-year lifetime member of the league and did wonderful things. And her son is um, a chip off the block. He did not fall from the tree. Uh, Peter was elected to the legislature, the Minnesota House of Representatives, in 2012. He's in his third term. His district includes Maplewood, so he, he lives in our league, league territory of Maplewood and represents that along with his other cities. For the last 10 years, he's been the, non the director of finance and operations for the Avenues for Homeless Youth, which is located in Minneapolis, and they provide emergency shelter, supportive services, and short-term housing for homeless youth, youth who are experiencing homelessness. So we really look forward to hearing his comments. I'm gonna introduce our second speaker so we can go seamlessly over to our second speaker when Peter is done. They're both gonna talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then we will have our fun part, the questions and answers. So Elaine Carnahan, oh, ice cream, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Elaine Carnahan um, works right in our district at Fairview Community Center and um, she's a senior career counselor and marketing coordinator for WAND, which is Women Achieving New Directions in the East Metro and Suburban Ramsey County. Um, and so she works with families who walk in the door or she can tell us how other ways she meets them and people who are unemployed, living in poverty and struggling to secure stable, affordable housing in our area. She, we hoped and she hoped to be able to bring a family or two who were experiencing homelessness, but she explained that she had somebody in June, she's had somebody other times, but once they do finally get housing, they weren't gonna stick around for a League of Women voter <laughs> panel. <laughs> Um, she has a myriad of community involvements that I unfortunately don't have time to go through that complement her work at WAND. Um, but I will say she does host monthly human services network meetings, so she interfaces with lots of other groups besides her own. And she co-chairs the Roseville Adult Education Advisory Council. So please welcome our two speakers. Oh, yes, uh, good evening. Thank you for reminding me, Mindy. Um, uh, first of all, an update on my mother. Uh, my mother and father are in the process right now of moving into an assisted living memory care unit in Woodbury called St. Teresa's. Uh, they are looking at moving out of the city of Maplewood. Uh, they signed the lease last week, and this coming Monday, Tuesday, they'll be uh, moving at that point in time. But mother is still getting around. She is still quite strongly opinionated as ever. Uh, so she does keep us on our toes. So we're looking forward to it. It'll be a lot easier for them. Uh, uh, with my mother's joints and everything, it's gonna be nice to be on one level with uh, elevators skipping up and down instead of the two-story <laughs> colonial they have where steep set of stairs going up and down all the time. So they're both pretty excited about moving in there. She regrets not being able to be here. She misses all you folks, so. Um, with that, I'll move into what I'm going to talk about, but one of the things I have learned that if I am not careful about trying to keep some kind of time, yeah. I can ramble forever. That's the Don't problem. Worry, that's what I'm here for. Oh, good. Thank you, Mindy. I've learned that as, 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 as I run for office, I have a tendency of starting to talk longer and longer. So I'm glad somebody is here to help keep me in line. Uh, first of all, I'll... Uh, I, I know that a lot of the focus is on, on affordable housing and, and trying to do what we can to make sure that there's more available. And it is really important. It's also uh, something that impacts our youth that we work with a lot. The, at Avenues for Homeless Youth, we've got a, a variety of different programs. And we serve primary youth who are between 16 and 21. Uh, so there's a number of barriers that just kind of crop up because of that. Just because about a third of our youth that we have are under the age of 18. So it's real hard to find any kind of housing that we're able to get them into. Uh, a number of them come from the foster care system. We've had foster care 
Uh, we've had, at the judicial system, place foster care kids directly into our facilities because there's nowhere else for them to go. So part of the problem that we're dealing with is there's some broken parts of the system elsewhere. Uh, so that leaves about two-thirds of our youth who are uh, 18 or older, and they run into a, a number of barriers. Is uh, Number one, they don't always have the life skills to be able to get there. Uh, many of them, uh, over half of them have been on, almost two-thirds of them have been through multiple episodes of homelessness. Uh, it's not unusual that we've got youth coming through who've been on the streets for three or more years. You know, so when you take a look, being on the streets that long, so you're wondering what's happening with the education and everything else. There's a lot of barriers that makes it much more challenging for them to be able to get housing. On top of that, for them to get into some of the housing facilities, uh, a lot of cities are, are very careful about wanting to make sure that people don't have criminal records getting in, making sure that you're staying up on it. But one of the consequences of it is that if you've got a youth who's had long-term homelessness, the odds are at some point in time they've been arrested multiple times. Uh, trespassing is not uncommon. Uh, we've, I've had youth that I've run into who, when it's 20 below, they'll find an apartment lobby and they'll sleep in the apartment lobby and they'll get hauled off to jail for that. You know, the, the problem is that's a trespass. So when you've got that kind of criminal trespass, all of a sudden it's a huge barrier from trying to get stable housing because people see that as a red flag. So things that act as a red flag for in the adult population act as a huge barrier and red, red flag when you're dealing with youth who already don't have a history, any kind of history that people can look at for credit. So these are things that kind of uh, impact there. And so, so as we're talking about affordable housing, what I'm trying to do is say, as we're talking about affordable housing, we've also got to consider some of the barriers that, for good reasons, when you're trying to keep out uh, people who are trying to use affordable housing for dealing drugs or other illegal activities, sometimes those same things you're looking at there can also unintendedly, if they're not crafted right, keep out those who definitely need to be able to have that opportunity to get into housing. So those are uh, some of the things that we have run into. Uh, some of the other things I want to mention a little bit is that uh, we've got several shelter programs, several host home programs. Uh, you know, we've got our primary shelter right now in North Minneapolis. We have 21 beds there. Uh, several years ago, and this is a story I think most of the folks here in this room should enjoy, is uh, we had people in the faith-based community in Brooklyn Park approach us about running a shelter for homeless youth up there. They discovered they had quite a large population that was being preyed on and dragged into sex trafficking. In less than 18 months from the time that the faith-based community contacted us to the time uh, everything was open and running a program, uh, we were able to put a program in place with the city of Brooklyn Park. Brooklyn Park used TIF money to build a shelter for us. They would have over 100 people coming to the public hearings. Everybody was in favor of it. Nobody spoke against this. I have never heard of a homeless project anywhere that you've been able to have that occur. And I watch it, whether you're Maplewood, whether you're Dinah, wherever it is, there are always people who are opposed. And what happened is you had a grassroots organization of strong, strong faith-based community pulling it together. And we're talking, there were over a dozen churches, and I think the final count was over 18 different churches were involved in helping lead this effort. And so, and that's part of the reason I'm bringing it up is looking at who are the other partners out there that can help make this happen. Because when you're running into affordable, wanting affordable housing out there, some of the same issues will crop up. And if you can develop a strong relationship with people in the uh, uh, faith-based community, that can help overcome some of the issues that are out there. And, and think of it too, if a city's gonna take tax increment dollars and use that to build a shelter, that tells you what kind of commitment that the city is saying is where our priorities are. Uh, so that is very unique. So we were able to put 13 uh, beds up in that facility. And it, it is very good that we've been able to have that, and that helps serve that part of the area. We have also a number of what we call host home programs. The first one started out for the GLBT community because between, depending on the stats you look at, between 20 to 40% of the homeless youth out there fall into the GLBT community. Um, we've seen instances where they've been thrown out of the homes, uh, and we run into it too. Some of our funders, when they hear that we support the GLBT community by providing housing, say, we will no longer fund you and walk away from us. So there are still those kind of segments out there. Um, and it's frustrating, uh, but those kind of things exist. Um, so the GLBT host home program started over 20 years ago. We just celebrated the 25th anniversary of that. And what happens is people open up their homes voluntarily and they agree to host youth. And what happens is it's a very different model, is the youth themselves interview the host and decide where they want to live. And we've had some great stories come out of that where in some instances 
it has been such a wonderful relationship is that the people who came close had actually ended up adopting the kids. And so, and they become part of their family. And this, and that program goes from basically 17 up to about 24. And it's become a model throughout the, uh, that other people across the country have used. Um, and what's very unique about it, there are no government supports that go into that. It's all organized within the community and supported within the community. And it has filled the need out there. Now, not every youth is going to be able to match into that because uh, some of them have been traumatized and need to come overcome where their trauma has been and everything else. But in a number of areas it's worked and we've had people placed throughout the entire metropolitan area. We also have several other host home programs that uh, work out in the uh, Hennepin County area, some that are toward the suburbs and some that are into the city of Minneapolis. And then the, a new one that we started because there was a huge issue and that's affordable housing for young families. Many of our youth that come into the program are in a situation where if about a, thir a third of the youth who are homeless have kids themselves. We are also in a situation because of our licensing that if youth comes in and they're pregnant, when they have the child, they cannot come back to us. We're not allowed to have infants in our facilities. And so as a result, it, we have to try to find them housing or put them into another shelter after the youth is born. We also find that in a number of instances is youth we are working with in this type of situation where young parents realize that they came out of a dysfunctional home. That the parenting they experienced was not, uh, was not very productive. There may have been mental health issues, chemical dependency issues, violence occurring within the home. And so they realized that the way they came up was, was not healthy, was not good. But because they have not been experienced what is good parenting, they're struggling. They wanted to know how could they not repeat the mistakes that they were experienced to. And so that's one of the things that drove us over time to try to find another model where we could provide housing for the young families, try to keep the mother and dad together, have them with their kids there and provide supportive services. We were lucky enough to get a HUD grant last year through the Hennepin County Continuing Care. And we've got, we're able to do 12 units, but the problem that comes into is the amount of affordable housing that's out there right now is so low. We are struggling to find enough um, landlords to be able to work with because there's such a shortage of rental housing out there. And these are the kind of things where it makes a huge difference is that you've got youth who work hard and there's so many people who have used the image, well, if you just work hard, you're going to do well. Mm -hmm. you know, after 10 years of watching how hard our youth work and how many of them are coming from communities of color where there's been so much disadvantages historically throughout that, you know, throughout our society that they're at a disadvantage coming out. And we need to figure out ways to how to address that. And I think by taking a look at providing the wraparound services, trying to provide more affordable housing so that the people who are working hard to, to improve their lot have got the, the pathway because if you don't have that stable housing, as, as you know, then it's hard to keep your job and everything else falls apart on top of that. So those are some of the things that we've been working on and that's why I see affordable housing being important. Another part of affordable housing that's real important is making sure we've got transportation is many of our youth don't have reliable cars. And as a result, they rely on that mass transit. So when mass transit isn't getting out to the quality jobs in the suburbs, they're limited by what they're able to do. You know, in North Minneapolis, it's real easy to get to the low-service jobs, but if you don't have a living wage there, they're not going to be able to afford to get housing because the rents are so high. They end up paying most of the money in housing. And so that transportation piece is critical, and that's why when you talk about affordable housing, we've got to make sure that particularly in the suburbs where we don't have reliable mass transit throughout the day, that we make that connection to make sure that we're setting them up for success. Because we've also heard where they started out, they had a car, the car broke down, eventually they became homeless. You know, and so that's another part as how sometimes the children have come to us is because the parents lost the house, now where do you go with the kids? They become homeless and then they end up with us. So that's just kind of a quick thing. I'll, I'll kind of cut it off there, look forward to the questions and we can dive into some of this much deeper. And I'll turn it over to me. Thank you. I'm probably gonna piggyback on many things that you said, but I'll be talking more about the families that I work with who are primarily single parents who are working, not getting cash assistance, they can be getting a multitude of other services, but not cash, and they are struggling to make ends meet. Um, when we equate, I do too, homelessness, I, in my mind, if you say homelessness, who's homeless? Many of us picture vagrants sleeping on park benches, possibly drunk or drugged or mentally ill. And, and we're sad because it's sad, but it doesn't infringe on our daily lives. 
And my job as an employment counselor for low-income single parents, I encounter people struggling to make ends meet. They are working but for low wages. Many are close to eviction and sadly some are homeless. They may be sleeping on a friend or relative's couch. They may be in a shady motel, and I don't mean shade trees in the front yard. <laughs> or, as I have found out, even sleeping in their car. These people are working. Moms with kids, moms and dads with kids, middle-aged women with no dependents. They cannot afford market rate rent on their incomes. If they are lucky or unlucky enough to get into a motel room, they get locked into the cycle of paying 60, 70, or $80 a night, buying fast food for them and their children, paying for laundry, going to work, leaving the kids alone, kids missing school, unable to save for a security deposit because they're paying so much to stay at the hotel every night, and the family trauma comes with more problems. In Ramsey County, they can apply for coordinated access, which is another topic I won't get into tonight, um, but they get put on a list for shelter. There is almost always a waiting list. We've been able to get some of the urgent cases treated as a priority, but there are still waiting lists, even for the most urgent cases. And there are lots of urgent cases. The mom and kids came into my office. Her kids are age three and four and eight and nine. She told me they were sleeping in their car. I had my doubts, then I went out to the car. She looked familiar to me, and I realized she worked in, a, worked in a store that I stopped by on my way to work many days. She worked full time with her four kids while living in her car. Could you speak up a little bit? Some of us are old. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, usually my husband Thank tells you. me I talk too well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so she's living in her car, and I doubted it, and I went out to the car and was very humbled to see that she was not lying. She was living in her car with her four children. The children, again, I'll say, were ages three and four, eight and nine. She continued to work full time, never missed work during this time, um, left her kids with a variety of people bordering on dangerous situations. I contacted colleagues, uh, some of you know Mary Sue Hansen from the Suburban Ramsey Family Collaborative, colleagues from the Angel Fund, which is a group of churches in the Roseville area that have partnered to help people with homelessness, um, Keystone social workers, as well as local church pastors in the Roseville area. We were able to get them into a shady, again, not with trees, motel for a few weeks. Then a team of us met with the landlord, we found a landlord who might rent to her to help, and we met as a group so that we could be more, give her more street credibility that the landlord might be willing to work with her even though she had um, some evictions as well as a misdemeanor on her record. Uh, we met with the landlord and we were able to get the acceptance process in order um, the, that was good news, but the bad news is that the rent was at the very top of what she could afford. But this was an urgent situation, so we pretty much had to take what we could get. They did pretty well for a while. School social workers became involved, community social workers got involved, Churches, church volunteers helped as well. And just as we all relaxed a little bit, the mom's wages were garnished for delinquent school loans. So this hardworking mom let one of her bills go without paying for a few months the trash bill. The landlord noticed a buildup of trash in the garage as well as some other damage to the house. He decided to sell the property. We talked to the tenant and you know of course in desperation why didn't you tell us you couldn't pay the trash bill we might have been able to ward off what was happening now in another eviction things fell apart quickly they had used up their time with some of the agencies they were homeless again back in a motel
Throughout this entire saga, this mom kept her job. She was able to get a better job, making $10.50 an hour. That doesn't seem like a great success, but with something on your record and with needing to be near home and work something with low skills, this was a success for her. She and the kids have recently moved to another state, but she was able to transfer with the same company. Hopefully their trauma will end without too much permanent damage to the kids. This was heart-wrenching for myself and some church members from St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Roseville, Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, who kind of adopted this family. Uh, one of the things we did was even get the family attending church. The kids were well known by church staff and church regulars. And that may not seem like a lot, but when you are lacking a support system, that's everything. Uh, the solutions, of course, I can tell you these sad stories and have cried many times about this story, telling this story. Um, but there are some solutions that I see, but it takes a village to make these solutions happen. We need to have sliding fee housing where it's based on your income or subsidized housing. We need ongoing case management. When she moved into that house and made the decision to let the trash pile up in the garage, Maybe if somebody had been monitoring her situation, they would have said on a weekly basis, okay, you can't let your trash go, what's going on? Or, you know, that window's broken, we need to look into repair, what happened? Just someone to help them kind of navigate life because many of the people I see did not have good housing in their childhood, did not have good parenting in their childhood. And now we expect them to be just like us. Um, ongoing case management, and then community support and not judgment. And I just want to throw in one quick story here. Another family that I had, um, she was working two jobs with five children, and she called me and she said, we have no beds. And once again, I thought, okay, you probably have one or two, but not a lot of beds or you're sleeping on a mattress. We got to their house, they had no mattresses. Five kids and a mom sleeping on the floor. They had been sleeping like that for a year. They did have blankets. We got them beds, delivered the mattresses. The kids were so happy. They were jumping on the mattresses, of course. Um, one of the church group volunteers, a group of volunteers from one of the churches, decided they would get blankets and spreads and sheets. And they brought them over and helped them make the beds. And a couple months later, one of the church volunteers called me and said, they're not using the sheets. We got them sheets. Why aren't they using the good sheets? And I talked to the mom. I said, you know, you should probably use the sheets to make the church people happy. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked, and she told me, she said, you know, these are our first mattresses, my first mattress. She said, I grew up with 11 brothers and sisters. We never had mattresses. So although I'm happy we have sheets, I've never had sheets either. So one thing that I have to work on, as, as well as people that we try to get involved in volunteering, is not to impose our middle class norms and values on other people who may have never experienced what we think they should experience. We can support them and help them and guide them and I think it starts when you're little kids, teaching kids about money and about, um, you know, values maybe that we think we should share. But I think the community support and not judgment is a really important piece of keeping these families engaged and thriving. Thank you. Minneapolis school system. Um, 
And one of the things that we know is if you're going to close the achievement gap, the most important, one of the key things is affordable housing. You wouldn't think it goes with the achievement gap, but if you look at kids who are homeless and highly, and, and couch surfing, they on average live at the bottom of all of our achievement. By the time they're in sixth grade, they've reached second grade. Okay? But my question to you, I'm really curious. We're working up here. How much do you do with people serving people in Mary's place? And what's the coordination among these systems that work on, affordable, uh, on shelters for families? Because if you don't know it, People Serving People is one of the largest shelters for families and children in the upper Midwest, and so on. So I'm just curious what the degree of coordination is at all. Uh, in, in terms of coordination, I, first of all, within the uh, youth serving community uh, in the Hennepin County, uh, West Metro, there's a lot of coordination that occurs back and forth. There's monthly meetings between the youth serving network over there. Uh, over the last couple of years, it's, it's been expanding out a little bit more with some of the agencies in the East Metro area. But uh, between the adult and children's system, the uh, youth system, there's not always been a lot. These are families. Right. These are families well, and, and, and you've got pregnant kids. Right. Parents. Pregnant kids. The problem is they don't have the openings. You know, so often that's usually where we're going to is with our youth is trying to get them into one of the programs over at uh, Mary's place and so often as and some of the different family shelters but the problem comes in they're already full and right. it's because they're waiting their families are waiting to get into affordable housing elsewhere and I think one of the ways I can uh, uh, maybe explain how affordable housing can make an impact on length of the stays in the shelters is uh, for quite a while until recently, the average stay of youth in our shelter was about 120 days. Uh, uh, over the past uh, 12, 12 months or so, that dropped down to under 90 days. And that's because there were two, a couple of facilities that opened up along uh, University here and uh, 66 Westover in the West Metro, where all of a sudden there were a lot of uh, units that came online specifically for, uh, specifically for uh, youth. And so as a result, as those housing units were available, it helps help us spin through youth a lot quicker who are ready to move in. Uh, the problem is we're now seeing the stays trend up because there isn't that affordable housing supply for youth that are ready to go in. We've got youth right now who've been with us for, um, the one I'm thinking of right now has been with us, I believe over nine months right now, and they've been ready to move into a unit for at least three months now, but there just isn't that unit. Uh, unit available and one thing I'd like to do take time to is I know it's representative Ellis Houseman has come over here I just want to make sure to introduce my colleague there in the in the house thank you for being here Ellis sure so many of these places like uh, people serving people Mary's place they also live on donors and there is this protectiveness so I wonder if the league could be part of what moves things together where we don't really care about their donor base, but we care about making things more seamless. Um, because, I mean, these are wonderful, all of them are wonderful organizations, but they're living on donors. And anyway, I just think it would be wonderful if we could coordinate more. But it might take us who don't care about the money. Well, and that's a, a great wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> the unfortunate part is, Minneapolis and St. Paul are very separate, or Ramsey County and Hennepin County, in how they deal with homelessness. In St. Paul, or the East Metro, I should say, you have to go through one place, coordinated access, which is uh, your, your place to visit would be Woodland Hills Church in North St. Paul. Uh, uh, uh. Maplewood. 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 Okay. <laughs> Right, right up there, right up there where I think it splits, right? <laughs> um, great church that tries to be really good in the community, and the concept of coordinated access is, was to make it a simplified method of getting homeless people on the list for shelter. Um, but as I said in the beginning, we have urgent cases, and because I work with some of the people that work for coordinated access, I've been able to make my point how urgent it is especially for this family um i and this was a year and a half ago but i ended up taking her and the four kids up there to apply had to call her employer to tell them she would be about an hour and a half late had them rush an intake so they could do the intake 
I played with the kids while she filled out the application. Um, we got out of there and she was going to be late for work, so I took the kids to the child care center and she drove, later I found out with no license and insurance, to her place of employment. So, complicated to get to Maplewood, North St. Paul area when you're in Roseville or when you're in St. Paul proper. Um, there has to be a better way, and there have to be people sitting down to create a more seamless, easy way. You shouldn't have to suffer when you're suffering already. Suffer to try to make it better. I will just add that the League of Women Voters in answer to Megan's question, what if the league could help with this? Um, that's why we called Mary Sue Hansen and, and she helped us with this program. And our housing committee also is working with Micah and uh, Gladys Anderson and I and, my, and the representatives for Micah invited local churches who they thought would be the most likely suspects. We sent out letters last um, July to like uh, 17 churches in the area and um, so I'm interested to talk to Elaine more afterwards because I didn't know about the angel fund we didn't know churches are already doing things I think churches may be suffering from exhaustion of being asked to do so many things that the you know community and government used to do better and or maybe never did do very well but I think could it's getting worse rather than better and so we only actually heard back from two churches so far and so Gladys and I and and John Slade from Micah have been trying to decide what to do since we only heard from two churches but um, Mary Sue Hansen said she's made efforts with local churches and um, some were said you know they just have overload and were you know tired of being asked all the time so I think it is is something we have to keep working on, but it's it's um, um, a problem. I especially though it's a strength when Representative Fisher just said they can actually head off uh, NIMBYs testifying if the, the churches or the local churches are strong and in force, and that's what we actually were are asking them to do. We're not asking them to provide services. We want them to be on notice. When um, we had the Roseville City Council meeting um, recently, and the league testified, and a lot of community people testified against, but uh, there weren't any churches there to add their voice, and I think they could have made a huge difference. Um, I'm going to ask one question ahead of, in case there's any others out there, because we have um, have a until eight o'clock if we have that many questions. But my, both of you mentioned. Um, that it's hard for people to get housing when they have criminal records, trespassing, or the kinds of things that people who are homeless so easily do, and then it haunts them for the rest of their lives. And um, so what is there, are there any ways to have them get expungement, or what would you suggest to head that off or deal with it once they have the criminal records? Um. Part of the problem is, is that once they're on there, it's very difficult to remove. And in some cases, people just take a look at the arrest records. And even if there's not a conviction, if they see they've been arrested, that is very difficult to... And I'm trying to remember, and I'm, I'm going to look at my colleague uh, in the back here, is I know we had some things on expungement, but I think it was very limited as to what we were able to do it for. Um, and something more broader like that, it would be... It, it, it's going to take some kind of legislative action. And it was gonna be, it's going to be an uphill battle to try to get something like that to wipe it out. Part of the problem is once it's on a record, it's there and very difficult to remove. Uh, and I think the best thing to do is to educate people that you need to look where the people are and maybe reconsider, and I would say not only in the uh, uh, housing area, but a number of employers need to do the same thing because we've seen numbers of our, our youth would love to be able to work in some of these higher paying jobs but because they say you can't have any kind of criminal record at all and some of these jobs I just kind of scratch my head going do you really need to have that on there you know they need to examine what it is established for what you're really trying to run out and the other part that goes in is 
because we've had a lot of our youth who deal with mental health issues, it's not unusual that they're self-medicated. And so usually, between, it's usually two things. It's usually alcohol or it's uh, marijuana. And so once again, it's not unusual that people may have convictions for, for marijuana. Now that's a drug conviction, and that right there prevents you from getting into most housing. As a matter of fact, even if you're a student, if you're applying for a loan, now that's a barrier, and you're not gonna be able to get any federal uh, help to uh, get any grants or anything. So these are the kind of barriers that we're running into, but this is the way the youth population is. So if we want these youth to be successful, then we have to figure out different ways to address some of these other things that eventually come into affordable housing. Uh, we, we too run into the issue of people having something on their record or being evicted on their record and then landlords don't want to rent. Uh, what we've done with several families is partner with the churches involved in the Angel Fund in Roseville. And uh, I'll do a shout out to John Clow, Pastor John Clawwider, who was with Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, but he moved on um, to another county. But he was instrumental in trying to make it okay with landlords calling. And if they know that there's a church supporting a family, you know, not, I, I don't mean financial support, but if they know that they have the backing of a, a faith um, family, that then they're more willing to listen. And Pastor Ali Farron from St. Michael's Lutheran Church and I have gone out for a couple of families to meet with landlords to kind of give the tenant a little more street cred because they're walking in with people who are involved in the community, so then they're more willing to trust. Um, and then, of course, we have to say, okay, please, don't do anything to screw this up. Because <laughs> our name is on the line here. But, but you know, we believe in the families and the little kids, and, and as I said, the kids had started to attend some of the churches, so they, they were becoming more integrated into the church community, as well as just being part of the community in general. And, and that's what anybody needs. That's what you or I need. If you move into a new neighborhood, you want to become part of that community, have the neighbors know you. If you have a problem, your neighbors might help you. You hope they never have to, but you hope you're in that community where people will walk alongside you and be your safety net. So that's what we try to do for a lot of the families. Um, and yet keep our boundaries and let them raise their children and not again, judging and imposing our values. I'm Kathy Juniper from Maplewood, and as somebody who sat at a table and listened to people doing the NIMBY speech, you get to be a real mean lady after a while. <laughs> you have to, this is what something you can do. You have to pressure your local officials to change their attitude. Do you want the microphone so they can hear you? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, you have to pressure your local officials. That's all there is to it. You have to say, this is a community that accepts people and we are not, we have nothing against that particular housing. And I have the scars and the shirt to prove that it can be done. We have Emma's Place, which is supportive housing. Sat through that one. You know, we were gonna go down the tubes. The whole city was going to hell in a handbasket. We'll let those people live there. Well, that was, I don't know eight years ago, nine years ago, and so far we haven't gone down the tube. And we also have the Ramsey County Family Shelter. That was another issue of, oh my word, we're going to you know where. Really? Well, it's been there a long time, and no, the police calls are not forcing us to hire eight new cops. That does not happen. We are happy and privileged to have Woodland Hills Church because they are an unbelievable public service, human service organization. If you have any churches in your jurisdiction that just need a little boost, and you have those two that are working together, that's the other clue. Woodland Hills is immense. They have like 11,000 members. Okay, most churches don't have that. But if you could talk to your own people in your own community of faith and say, can we look around and see if there's a neighboring church where we could do something People who do nothing are what are causing this to go on and on. And NIMBY, I am totally deaf to, okay? Because I have sat through enough and seen that neighborhoods are just fine. As a matter of fact, Emma's place actually improved the neighborhood. 
And we, we now have two other examples up by the mall. We have the supportive housing for families. We just opened a new, at a different level, a new housing development on Frost Avenue, the Villages on Frost, which is for working poor. And you know who can live there? Starting cops, starting teachers, <laughs> starting nurses. You have to get this through to your neighbors and your elected officials. This is nobody, it's not those people, it's us people. And one of the ways you do that is take people on. You just say, I have it down now. I can close my eyes and do it. It's like, where did you live when you were young? Did you live in an apartment? Uh-huh. Did you have a couple of kids? Uh-huh. So were you one of those people? Silence. Everybody has been those people somewhere along the line. That's how we get where we're going. And many people these days have many more disadvantages. You've heard it. I'll give you an example of something that shocked me after 16 years on the city council. You would think there'd be nothing that could shock me. But three years ago, some people from the North St. Paul Nickwood Oakdale School District, who have kind of an angel program of their own, came in for some charitable gambling money, which now we have $80,000 in requests and $20,000 worth of money, but it's a nice thought. But anyway, these women had done their research. At that time, it was, it'll be four years ago this fall, in the North St. Paul Maywood Oakdale School District, 387 children lived in cars. Shame on us. Find out what it is in the Roseville School District. If it's five kids, it's too many. This is not over there. This is not down in Mississippi. This is not even in North Minneapolis. This is the suburbs. We can't stop. We absolutely cannot. And we have the living proof in Maplewood. These people do not destroy your community. As a matter of fact, they add to it in many different ways. So I implore you, if you do nothing else, corral your city officials and nail them. I'm, so, I'm sorry, shame on Roseville. Shame on them. They've had two chances in the past year and they've blown them. Really? Well, I, you know, with all respect to you, those of you who live in Roseville, you're not all that hotsy totsy and better than me. Are. <laughs> you're a suburb. We're a suburb. Same age bracket, approximately same population, only we have better schools here. <laughs> what I say? Um, offer it to other people. We can share it. We do not need to keep those people out. Because first of all, those people will be us someday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think most of you here probably started out in a tiny house or an apartment. You might have been lucky enough to only need one income. Now everybody needs two to stay alive. But how would you like the options that these people have talked about in your own life? And even if you don't have any of those close to you, that doesn't exempt you. If anything, it increases our obligation. You go to your city officials and say, knock it off, look at this, it's a good thing. Or would you rather have them sleeping in cars in the park? Oh, okay, well that's a dandy idea. No, people listen when you get them up close and in their faces. Same thing with the legislators, although you might be closer to hopeless than local officials. But don't let them, don't let them wiggle away. Don't make these two people fight it by themselves. That means when you have a family gathering and somebody lives in a district, different legislative district, stick it to them. You say, go talk to your legislator. What's going on where you live? We can't solve this in one little piece. But your leaders, or thinking about being leaders, which means you've been last week in now, do something. That kind of thing doesn't take a lot of your time. It just takes some guts and your heart. And if I hadn't lived through it, I couldn't testify to it. But it works. And we're not done, and we're not off from under. We still need to do more, but it works. Um, 
I'm going to impose my middle class standards <laughs> here uh, in my question. But do these people have access? Do you do something to help them get birth control? Because frankly, that is a big problem with people who are low income. Uh, I'll handle it from two different angles. First of all, from the legislative side, we've got a certain party in the state who keeps on trying to keep on organizations doing that. And right. uh, there have been a couple of times where the programs that they fund, they're always going after Planned Parenthood. Right. But at the same time, it's also taking away from the same programs like Face to Face in St. Paul, where they provide these services. So these services are under attack on a regular basis. So that's number one problem. Number two problem, at least with the youth who are homeless out there, it, they just don't have access to it. Uh, and I'll use examples. We've got uh, in Washington County, I haven't talked to some of the folks doing outreach in Washington County, uh, there are parts of Washington County where they're actually living out in the woods and then they come to the um, uh, the shelter, not the shelter, it's the rest stop on 35 and the school bus comes, picks them up and takes them to school. Okay. They just don't have the opportunity to have access, so it comes down to an access uh, situation. And in some situations where you've got youth who are, it's 20 below and they're faced with a choice of you know, engaging or being warm, this is this is reality. This is where they go. This is a, this. It's survival sex. And when you're in that kind of me message, you just don't have too many other things that you can do. You take what's out there, and those are the hard realities of what we're facing in our society. Uh, I know that our shelter, we're always making these things available. Condoms are available, birth control, all those kinds of things are out there. But those are available for those who can make it to our shelter. The right. vast majority of kids are not in shelters. On any given night, we've got between four and 6,000 youth on the streets, and we've got shelters for less than one-third of them. So when you've got that kind of thing going on, you know, there's a, they just don't have that availability for services, and this is the metro area where we've got the greater availability. You get in the rural area, the problem's just as bad in the rural area, they're just able to hide it much easier. Just, I totally agree with everything Peter said, um, and I think that from my perspective, being a parent of three kids and foster parent of one um, over the years and having many wayward kids at my house because it was the place to be <laughs> fun, um, even though I was kind of mean, I was fun. But I talked to a lot of kids about sex. Uh, their parents wouldn't talk to them. And I did that because nobody talked to me. So I wanted to be the parent that you could go to to learn about birth control and sex and, and navigating relationships and self-worth. And I think we really have to focus on school districts starting when kids are very little, not only teaching them about self-worth and valuing themselves and valuing developing values and developing systems of self-respect but I think we need to teach them too how to survive nobody taught me about money I learned the hard way in my 20s nobody taught me about relationships those are things that are basic living skills that I think we need to teach not what's right or wrong but just teach kids how to make better choices and if you learn that, if you learn how to do banking when you're 13, you have a much better chance of succeeding when you're 23 than if nobody's ever talked to you about money at all. And same thing with relationships and sex and having children. Um, I will say that the women that I've encountered who have been homeless with multiple children take great pride in being good parents. And these four little kids that were living in the car were always immaculate and their hair was done and they were dressed very um, fashionably, I want to say, like matching outfits. I mean, they looked like kids for an ad. And this lady took great pride in her kids. Unfortunately, somewhere along the way, her self-esteem allowed her to be in bad relationships where there was no other supporting parent. So I think we have to start young, teaching not only women their value, but men their value and personal responsibility. Right. So that's my mom talking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you all agree with me. But I think the earlier we start, the better. Rachel. Uh, I'm a big fan of, I don't know if you heard the organization, 
Okay, she's talking about the lift garage, which was sponsored by women to help primarily women, but poor people who need car repair, and they do the work, and it's just for cost, correct? Okay, and there's another one that came across my desk a couple of weeks ago that's owned by men, and it's the car repair for single parents. And I've left three phone calls. They must be really busy, and I would imagine they are, but I haven't heard back yet. Um, car repair is huge. There, there is some emergency funding from a variety of different programs, but as you know, if you have a car, unless it's brand new or you're leasing it, when it has problems, they're not cheap. So we try to keep people in cars. Car insurance is expensive. Uh, what's even more expensive, expenses, <laughs> expensive is if you get picked up driving without insurance, which I've cautioned people that I'm helping. Um, if you think you have problems now, just wait. Right. <laughs> but it's tough. When you look, if you're making $10.50 an hour and you're paying $1,200 for an apartment and you need to repair your car or you need to pay your insurance or you need to get your license tabs, but you need to feed and clothe your kids and keep them under a roof, Eeny, meeny, miny. What do you let go? You know, it's a tough choice. So the one woman let her trash go. Someone else let their driver's license expire. All can create much bigger problems. I think what we really need to focus on is having a livable wage. Um, I did bring a handout. I didn't bring many. But it's from Huffington Post. This is the hourly wage you need to afford a two-bedroom apartment around the United States. Can you speak louder? Um, even in the poorest of states, the living wage to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment, I think in Tennessee, is still like $14 an hour. So the, the woman that I talked about coming to me making $9.50 an hour with four children. So we've got to really work on making a livable wage so that people aren't shamed for being in entry-level jobs. Uh, not everybody with four kids can go to training for six months at, at this time. Maybe she can in the future. But for right now, let's try to get a livable wage. So I'm sitting here listening to frustrated people who can't understand what you're saying. And the first thing you're saying is the livable wage sucks. It's not high enough. And affordable housing is way too high, am I right? And then we all these other structural barriers. I want to know how many lawyers are in this group or married to lawyers and could we mobilize a whole bunch of lawyers to work on this? But that's what you're very popular is people are having trouble with you. Well, maybe maybe some of these I can hear you, but some of these ladies might want to everybody there's I think there is some space. Is there some space for me that should be? I'm sorry. I'm trying to help. Um, no, no. And then my son makes $13. Any other questions? Mindy? Yes, yeah, and I can use the microphone if necessary. But I'm thinking of Kathy's comments and um, our kind of putting ad action advocacy a little bit more up front and incorporating it in our board. This, this is the first time, first year we're, we've been doing that. Could you speak a little bit to the, about the Observer Corps and what we could do maybe more specifically to hold 
officials their feet to the fire, which is basically what Kathy is saying that we need to do that. Well, I'm thinking maybe tie that in with your comments. Yes. Uh, well, as Rita said last week. Okay. As Rita said, last week we had uh, an observer program and we're focusing um, this year on school board meetings and city council meetings. So we're, we have um, people who came who learned about observing local co governments and then uh, many signed up and so we're trying to um, have people observe you know certain meetings and so we want to um, focus on for the city councils this year what are they doing about affordable housing so and then when people observe and they let us know when they are done if there's going to be a hearing on any type of affordable housing in any of our five cities then we will put out an action alert and try to get more people there we're, we have to work harder to get the churches there because um, you know when the league is there we have a, a big voice but if it's for the only group then um, obviously we're not always listened to if the neighborhood NIMBYs are out in force so you need a lot of voices so we need to um, observe the meetings find out when things are going on and then have better coalitions for um, for helping us when and alerting other people to come and and all of us whether we have time to observe meetings or not Look for action alerts. We did have like two or three rows of league members um, at the Roseville hearing uh, But we could have done a better job of having our buttons so people could know uh, that we were there I think uh, everybody on the council didn't know who were league members perhaps so it's a work in progress But it's we're organizing Uh, representative or not representative uh, council member Jason Atten voted for it and nobody else this was a proposal for affordable housing in Northwestern Roseville actually it was it was market rate housing actually and um, there were only, I think it was 60 units of affordable housing, and they were workforce housing. Uh, they were for teachers, accountants, young nurses, that sort of thing. There were um, six units for people who were homeless, and four of those were go going to be for veterans, and two were gonna be for um, the real homeless people. <laughs> And even so, um, and so Florence Sprague, if you haven't read it, um, in our uh, September voter, she wrote a wonderful column on all the arguments against affordable housing. And she said in her column, you know, if, you know, really think about yourself, if you say you're for affordable housing, but, and then you list off all the things she had in her column, like too much traffic, too much crime, you know, too much whatever, then are you really for affordable housing? And uh, so I commend that column to you. It was uh, brilliant, as all her columns are, but this one, you know, just hit my heart. So any other questions for our panelists who are you know, we don't have a chance every day to talk to people who are who are on the ground level. Kathy. Based on where we are now with transportation, which means we'll have mass transit when I'm dead and some of the rest of you might be too. But we've been trying to negotiate with um, Ramsey County on transportation plans for Rice and Larpenter. And that's an area where there's a lot of poverty, particularly in St. Paul. Is there any way people can put pressure on an organization like eight Ramsey County, perhaps the commissioners, wink, wink, um, to look at the bus routes because one of the things we've discovered is that within the city limits, they run every 30 minutes, but you leave the city limits 
I mean every 15 minutes, I'm sorry, you leave the city limits and it's 30 or 45. So how can you take public transportation to work or to the doctor or to anything else? So it seems to me that might be another place for some activism. You can comment if you want to, but it might be more immediate than waiting for the huh, transit system. Uh, transportation is an issue, um, and particularly when you get to the second tier suburbs, uh, White Bear Lake has nothing, Bonamidi, which is third tier. Uh, there's homelessness out in those areas, and right now the churches are looking at trying to find ways to purchase vans and try to run people back and forth in vans. Uh, working with homeless people up into to Hugo, there's nothing up there outside of the rush hour. Uh, what you need to do is not only working with the, your local officials, but putting pressure on the Met Council. The Met Council seems to have left us in the East Metro in the dark. If you take a look at how far out the route's going, and I'll speak now from the experience I've, I've seen with our youth. You know, they've got bus service up in Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center going all the way up throughout the day. You know, you take a look over here in the East Metro, you're lucky if you get outside the borders of Minneapolis or Maywood and still have bus service, and that's only one mile outside the border of St. Paul. So there is a big disconnect there. And the people I, that have given me feedback at the Met Council said, well, your densities aren't there. But if you look at the densities per square mile for our suburbs, they're actually higher than where they're going out in Minneapolis. So there is a disconnect there, and I think there's some regionalism going on. And we need to figure out how to address that because the folks in the West Metro are not hearing us. And I think that, and I'm seeing some nods from Representative Hausman back there. That's part of the, that's some of the battle that we're uh, battling right now is that uh, there is a disparity that's going on and it's having a bigger impact on those who are poor in our area than it is on the West Metro. Uh, that's, that's kind of my personal opinion on it. Um, two action ideas. I'm going to stand up now so that everybody can hear me. Okay, sorry. Um, my very first job when I moved to Minnesota from Pittsburgh was with the Ramsey County Commissioners. I won't tell you who the commissioners were then because many of them are long gone. <laughs> um, but it was kind of a known to be a good old boys network at that time. And if people would come in and complain, and I was their first point of contact when they walked in, I was just a young girl fresh out of school. and. Um, if, and one of the groups that came in were senior citizens. They were the Gray Panthers. And they wanted to complain about lots of things and they wanted a lot of change. And they would come marching in in droves. And the commissioners would try to sneak out the back door. <laughs> and they would, they would run up and tell me, tell them, tell them I have a meeting, tell them. And so I paid close attention for future things that I would protest to see that they didn't like a lot of people coming to their door and complaining. So keep that in mind because we have power in numbers, right ladies and gentlemen? And then the other thing is uh, years ago, I've been with this program 23 years, we were looking for somewhere to have our evening workshops. We provide a meal and we provide childcare and we do uh, topics of interest to single parents who are working. And we were, our budget was cut and so we could give them crackers and cheese, but they're bringing kids right after work and everybody's hungry and tired. So we talked to two churches and the two churches that I mentioned before that I have just great esteem for, Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Roseville and St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Roseville. And St. Michael's came on recently in the last couple of years but Prince of Peace has been with us for about 15 years, cooking for our women and kids, sometimes providing childcare, always providing Christmas uh, holiday gift cards and treats and whatever they can. And their congregation has been so welcoming and they said, hey, we can do this. So they partner with the other church, they figure out the schedule, they have a food budget, and all I did was go in once and tell them how badly we needed to be the families. So again, um, power in reaching out. Thank you. And the Ramsey County, oops, the Ramsey County Commissioners are slated for next year. We're going to start observing them next year, hopefully. <laughs> Like, I mean, usually the League of Women 
voters just like a three-year thing on something. It sounds like we're recognizing this isn't a three-year thing, that this is a much longer thing, and it's a very important issue for us to address, and I would champion that. It's going to take quite a while, and if we're going to solve the issue of inequality in our society, we have to deal with affordable housing and kids who don't have a place to live. And it's a wonderful thing to put a lot of effort into. Well, if there are no more questions, I think that is a very nice note to end on. So thank you, Megan, and thank you to Elaine Carnahan and Representative Peter Fisher.